I have been doing something cool with my family lately. We have been revisiting some old sitcoms now that they're streaming services. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun introducing my kids to Andy Griffith. We did that whole series. Uh, the Clampets from the Beverly Hillbillies. Yeah. Uh, more recently, we got into ALF. Anybody watch ALF? That show is way better than I remember it being. It's a good show. And then uh, just this week, we started Family Matters. You remember with Steve Urkel? Did I do that? You know? And, uh, and, and my kids love it. And I'm like, this is great. It's timeless and it's clean and it's, it's just funny. Now, as we're going through these shows, I've, I was reminded of a principle that makes some television shows awesome. And this is the principle. Family life is insane. It's crazy. Like, think about all the great shows throughout history, and so many of the sitcoms are based around, like, a bunch of people that live together and how crazy it is that they get to live together. And I think basically every episode is based on this premise. What crazy thing has this family got to put up with this week? And then you watch it play out, and, of course, in, you know, 23 minutes, it's resolved. And it's, there's, you know, dramatic music that plays, and the dad hugs the daughter, and then you know that it was a good show. And so that's how TV used to work. Um, now, I think that one reason that these shows have been so popular is because we can really relate with them. When we see the craziness on Everybody Loves Raymond, we're like, that's my family. Like, I've seen that. Maybe you're more like the Simpsons. Like, that's, those are my, those, that's my family, right? And you look at what's going on, and the reason we laugh is because it's easier than crying. <laughs> you know, we're like, this is really how my life is sometimes. Now, uh, on the one side, we can laugh and we can say it's funny. But on, on the real side, growing up in a family that has drama and pain, and there's a word we use for it often, dysfunction, it's got a lasting mark on us, doesn't it? Like, the things that we grow up in really form who we are and what we become. And so as we watch these things, uh, sometimes it's just a therapy to help us get, you know, through it or to understand it. So this week we're starting a new teaching series, and uh, every year we, we take a series of our year and we focus on the life of someone from the Bible that we really believe we could learn from and we could grow to become a better God chaser. I'll talk about that phrase, God chaser, in just a second. But we see the life of that person, and we say, what can we learn from that life? And the, the truth about our person that we're studying today, you've seen his name on the screen already, is that this person grew up in one of the most dysfunctional families ever to walk the face of the earth. I mean, the family that we see at the beginning parts of the Bible are a hot mess. And so this person, now here's, here's the accolades of this person. This person's gonna grow up to become one of the most powerful men in the entire world in his lifetime. He would save thousands and thousands of people from a famine. They would rest, restructure the agricultural system of one of the most prominent nations in the world because of this person's influence. And he would become an important bridge as God uh, unveils the story of what he wants to do in the world through the nation of Israel because of his life. But before he did any of those amazing things, this guy grew up in a crazy circus of a dysfunctional family. His name is Joseph. Uh, Joseph gets a lot of mention in the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. In fact, most characters in the book of Genesis get like a paragraph, maybe a chapter. Joseph gets 14 chapters to cover his life. And in almost every single one, we see Joseph having to overcome trial after hurt, after pain, after brokenness, after misunderstanding, after imprisonment, after terrible thing in his life, over and over and over. But on the other side of it, we learn what it means to be a God chaser. Because through it all, he's somehow able to keep his focus on God. So we're gonna unpack his story over the next seven weeks. And, and as we do that, I think that you're gonna start to see yourself in Joseph's life a little bit. Hopefully not the whole thing. Hopefully you haven't gone through anywhere near as much trauma as Joseph has gone through. But week by week, I think we're gonna find some elements that we can pull out of. Let me talk about being a God chaser for just a second. Uh, at our church, we have three core goals. And actually, uh, I've been a little bit guilty of not bringing them up much recently. So if you knew, you have, maybe not have heard these three goals, but I wanna bring it back to the forefront. I want us to remind ourselves what we're here to become and to do. This is all straight out of scripture. But we wanna be God chasing grace-shaped love agents. God-chasing, grace-shaped love agents. It's just a way of rephrase, rephrasing one of Jesus' uh, most important teachings, the great commandment that we should love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. We should love others as ourselves. And so God-chasing, grace-shaped love agents. A God-chaser is someone who puts God at the core of everything that they do. So their decisions, their planning, uh, their finances, their relationships, the way that they uh, conduct business, everything that they do comes from this place of them wanting to be a God chaser first. And Joseph 
was a God chaser. But before he could see where God was taking him, time after time, he just gets slapped down, pushed down, thrown down, and has to overcome the situation that he's in. So let's meet Joseph. To meet Joseph, if you've ever been in counseling, uh, therapy of any kind I have, one of the first questions that the person's going to ask you is, let's talk about your father. (laughs) Yeah, and so let's start there with Joseph, okay? We're going to meet Joseph's dad. His name is Jacob, uh, and we're going to meet Jacob actually in Genesis. If you've got a Bible, you want to go ahead and grab it and flip over. In our Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Genesis today. We're going to start at chapter 29. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, feel free to use your phone. Uh, we've also got some free Bibles we give away every week, so grab one before you leave. We want to make sure you've got a Bible. You can get one now if you want to. And we meet Joseph, uh, Joseph's dad. His name is Jacob. Now, Jacob's a pretty important figure in the Bible. In fact, uh, later God changes his name. Does anybody remember what he changes Jacob's, Jacob's name to? Israel. Very good. Israel. So all of Jacob's descendants become the Israelites. Okay? So all of the people you see in the Old Testament essentially descend from Jacob. When Jacob was young, he got himself a job as a shepherd for a guy named Laban. Now, Laban turns out to be a jerk, okay? I just want to go and spoil that for you from the top. He meets Laban, and Laban does, and they make a deal, because what happens is Jacob sees Laban's youngest daughter, Rachel, and he's like, man, she's cute. I'm trying to marry her. And this is back in the day of dowries, when a young man would approach the father and offer a bride's price, and, you know, back during, like, true chauvinism, right? It was like, what? But anyway, it's like, this is the way it went. And so he offers a price for his daughter's hand in marriage and says this is the price I will work for you for seven years if you will give me the hand of your daughter Rachel in marriage and so we'll look at a couple of scripture we're actually going to be kind of skipping through the scripture because there's so much there's 14 chapters of Joseph's life here and we're just starting out in his dad's life Jacob so we're just going to read a couple of scriptures as we get through verse uh, chapter 29 verse 20 so Jacob served seven years to get Rachel but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her Oh, this is sweet. This is starting out great. This is starting out great. So we see, but things are about to take a turn here. If you know the story, just hang on. Because I, I want you to take in the gravity of what's going in this person's life. It was the custom in this culture for an older daughter to be married before a younger daughter is allowed to get married. The problem with Jacob's arrangement is that his, his love, Rachel, was the younger daughter. And her older daughter, Leah, wasn't married yet. And uh, from what we learn from Scripture, we find out that he, uh, apparently she wasn't as attractive as, um, as Rachel, which is a sad commentary on what was going on, but she didn't have any suitors, and so uh, that proposes a problem for their family. It would be undignified. It would be, um, you know, uncouth to let Rachel get married before Leah. You just can't have that. So Laban's got a plan, and it, something that we got to understand about this culture, too, is the way that weddings happened. Apparently, the bride wasn't very easily seen, very clearly seen during a wedding ceremony, which is like the opposite of what we do today. Like today, it's like centerpiece, and everyone stands, and we look at the bride, and, uh, and the dresses are getting increasingly smaller, and, you know, it's like we really want to see the bride these days. But in these days, like a picture of Middle Eastern garb today, okay, just wrapped up, but then also a veil, and you're not seeing who's under this thing. So Laban's got a plan. I'm going to switch my daughters. Yes, yeah, see, while Jacob thinks he's going to marry Rachel, I'm just going to switch Leah in there. No big deal, right? No big deal. They, you know, they're sisters. Same thing. Not the same thing. If you're married and your wife has a sister, right? Not same thing. It's like this is not going to go well at all. Genesis 29, verse 22. So, and Laban invited everyone into the, in the neighborhood and prepared a wedding feast. Good for Laban. You're a good dad. But that night when it was dark, Laban took Leah to Jacob, Jacob, and he slept with her. And in this culture, once you seal that deal, you're in for life. You're married. There's no going back. There's no annulment. There's no redo, like, I got the wrong sister. My bad. No. He's married. So this, you know, the inevitable happens. Jacob wakes up the next morning. And maybe at the nighttime and the candles weren't very bright. I don't know how he didn't notice. I just have no clue how that happened. But he wakes up. Can you imagine rolling over, and you're expecting to wake up next to your spouse, and you wake up, and it's their sibling. (laughs) Oops. (laughs) And so this is what goes down. Imagine Jacob's surprise, but, you know, like, I think a lot of emphasis has been put on Jacob's surprise, but I'm trying, I tried to put myself in Leah's shoes a little bit this week. Can you imagine me, Leah? I don't think she slept well that night. I bet she was up before Jacob. I bet she was just sitting there like, any minute now, he's going to wake up. And then she had to be the one to explain what her dad had done. See, what had happened was... (laughs) My dad's not a nice guy. I'm sorry. And so imagine Rachel. Now, Rachel's been waiting seven years also to get married. 
But this was her wedding day. And what does her dad do? Stay in the house. So Jacob is furious. He goes and he approaches Laban. In verse 25, this is the first half, he says, what, did, what have you done to me? <laughs> what a phrase. Or Leah. What have you done to me? Jacob raged at Laban. I worked seven years for Rachel. Why have you tricked me? It's not our custom here to marry off the younger daughter, head of the firstborn, Laban replied. Like, like that explains it. Oh, it's not your custom. Okay, well, that seems totally, my bad. But he's got a solution. And see, this is Laban's plan all along. Wait until the bridal week is over. Give us a week. And then we'll give you Rachel too. Provided that you work another seven years for me. Problem solved. See, Laban had this plan all along. I sneak Leah in, get her married. Got that done. Check. We wait one customary week, and then we let her sister get married. Check. Save face. Everybody's married. And I get seven years more of labor from Jacob, who's apparently a pretty good worker. Laban does not win dad of the year. Okay? He's not going to get the mug. He's not going to get the t-shirt. It's a terrible move. Dysfunctional. So side note here. I just want to kind of mention this because I love going through the teachings and getting to kind of deal with some of the complicated issues of the Bible. Um, You might have noticed that we're in the Bible and Jacob gets to have two wives. Polygamy. Now this is a culture that accepts polygamy. It's it's, it's in the Middle East. It's in ancient times. A lot of cultures accepted this. In Scripture, we don't ever see God condoning polygamy. It's very clear in Scripture that God wants marriage to be one man and one woman for their whole life, and that's what marriage is. Uh, However, uh, one thing I love about God's grace and his ability to use humans as he says, you know what, this isn't my plan, I'm not condoning this, but I can still work through you. So maybe you're in a place in your life where you've made some mistakes, or you're in a place where you've, you've been, you're like, I don't know if God condoned the lifestyle that I lived or some things that I've had. I'll tell you this, God can work through you. He works through this family. In fact, he's going to establish the entire nation of Israel out of this union. Uh, how, but there's reasons why God has his rules, and one of them is when you have more than one wife, there's going to be some drama, okay? And it gets even crazier. Uh, I encourage you, um, the, uh, the, next, uh, the next week, over the next week, get, get your Bible out. Open it up to Genesis chapter 29 and 30, okay? You're going to need a post-it note, and you're going to need a pencil, and maybe a pencil sharpener, okay? And I want you to take notes about this competition that's about to happen between Rachel and Leah. Now, now Jacob is kind of a jerk in his early life. Uh, his, his nickname, actually, uh, the, his name means the deceiver. And if you know his story about his brother Esau and how that all worked out, you know, like Jacob didn't start out too great. But he's trying to do right. So he finds out that what Laban has done, and he says, okay, I'll marry her, and I'll work for seven more years for you. He wants to do the honorable thing. And they begin their family. Right off the bat, it says, Leah was not loved by her husband Jacob. Maybe you've been through an unloving marriage. It's, I can't imagine. It's tragic. And this woman is unloved, and her sister, who apparently is, is seen as more attractive than her, uh, is loved very deeply by their husband. Well, God blesses Leah, and she's able to have children. She has four sons. Oh. Rachel is not able to get pregnant. Drama happens. To compensate, Rachel says, you know what? I can't get pregnant, but I've got this servant girl. Why don't you try with her. She'll be our surrogate mother, and, and we'll try with her. Well, she's able to conceive. The, the girl's name is Bilha, and she has two sons. So now we've got six children. Not to be outdone, Leah offers her servant girl. We've done good. I've got a servant girl too, and Jacob's like, well, okay, if I must. And so he's got another person, and so then they have two more sons, and then two more with Leah. Okay, if you're trying to keep up here, we've got now four wives, Ten sons, there's one daughter also, by the way, that's important too, but she doesn't get a whole lot of credit here, and still no children with the favorite wife, Rachel. Now drama is hard in a family, and it leads to a lot of dysfunction, and there's a lot of infighting that goes on. You got all that? A lot of things. You can take your notes, it's going to be crazy later when you read through it. And then finally we arrive at the moment we've been waiting for. We're not here to talk about Jacob's life. We're studying Joseph. Rachel finally gets pregnant with the 11th child of this family. And she has a boy, and she names him Joseph. And this is the hot mess, dysfunctional family that our guy is born into. 
He comes right into that thing. He didn't ask for anything. Now, a lot of other things happen. For one, uh, his dad, Jacob, has a falling out with Laban. Imagine that. Uh, they, they have a big falling out. And so he takes his whole clan, and they just move away. And then there's another little confrontation with his uncle Esau. That works out favorably, so that was good. But uh, when he's 11 years old, his mom, Rachel, she gets pregnant again. She has another son. Yay, his name's Benjamin. But she dies giving him birth. So now 11-year-old Joseph is displaced from his homeland. He's not with his cousins and his grandparents anymore. His mom has passed away. And he lives in a family full of brothers that we're gonna find out hate his guts. They can't stand him. We've got a group full of brothers who all understand our dad didn't love our moms. Whether it was Leah's kids or whether it was the kids of the servants and the kids of the servants were actually treated like lesser people And so now we end up with Joseph and his young brother, Benjamin, and they're kind of the outcast, ostracized brothers of the group. Now, I don't know what kind of family environment you grew up in, but when I look through this story, what I see is stories that I hear over and over and over again in the families that I meet in our church family and in community. Because maybe you didn't have all of that drama, but we have our own drama. What do we do with that? Where do we go with that? And how in all of that are we able to pursue God with our life? Because it's hard enough just to get out of bed in the morning sometimes, right? Right? Growing up, Joseph dealt with a lot of dysfunction, a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, and maybe you can relate to that. It all comes to a head when these jealous brothers start to grow up. Now, in the stories that you might have read about Joseph, I think we picture them all like the Brady Bunch, and they're all kids, and they're all living in this house together. The stories that we read, we're talking about grown men, okay? And so as the next two weeks, the rest of this week and next week, we're going to hear the rest of the story next week, plays out. I want you to imagine, these are all grown men, okay, and they're dealing with some stuff. Uh, it's a powder keg, and it's ready to explode. Things are not going well in this young man Joseph's life. Jacob doesn't even try to hide the fact that Joseph is his favorite son. Okay, so he gets the best clothes, he gets the easiest jobs, he gets the most affection. And this wasn't good for the brothers. It wasn't good for our guy Joseph. And so Joseph, while he's dealing with all this hurt, we see that Joseph starts to develop this attitude. Okay, now here's one thing that I've understood about dysfunctional relationships. Yes, it's everyone else's fault, right? It's always everyone else's fault, except for it's not. A lot of times we bring our own mess to the party. That's what Joseph's about to do here. There's three things. We're just, that's a huge story. I'm trying to condense it down. There's three things we want to look at that Joseph does here that are going to not only take this powder keg and let it fill up with more black powder, but it's going to light the match. You can find it there in chapter 37. Okay, we're going to actually look at some scripture now again. Chapter 37, verse 2. He was a tattletale. Joseph was a tattletale. Anybody grow up with any tattletale siblings? Yeah, you ever want to punch them in the teeth? Okay, yeah. okay. Genesis 37, 2. Remember, these are grown men. Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brother were doing. Now, we might think that's not a big deal, but the, the biblical author felt like it was a big deal because he wrote it down. Okay, so I don't know exactly what he was tattling about, but it was some things that he felt like, no one likes to snitch, okay? Yes, you should tell when something bad's going on and the authorities need to know, the proper authorities, but no one likes a straight up snitch. And Joseph's timing and judgment here are terrible because what he doesn't have the, um, we talk a lot in my family because we have young kids about a concept. You know this concept? It's called self-awareness. You familiar with this concept? You should be, or maybe you need to work on your self-awareness, right? Self-awareness. Joseph doesn't have the self-awareness to understand like what's about to happen shouldn't happen. Okay, so that's number one. He's a tattletale. Number two, because his dad, uh, Joseph's my favorite boy, he's daddy's special guy, Maybe you've heard of this special gift that Joseph's dad, Jacob, gives him. You know what it is? What is it? It's a coat, okay? It's a coat. It's, there's been a Broadway musical about it. It's, it was a Technicolor dream coat, apparently. Um, it's, it's, it, a lot of people who don't know anything about the Bible have heard about this coat. So, so Joseph does this thing, or Jacob does this thing, gives his son Joseph. We're going to read it in verse 3 of chapter 37. Now, Israel, remember, that's Jacob. Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. So he made for him an ornate robe. Now, we don't know exactly what that phrase, ornate robe, means. Um, when I was a kid, it meant that when we do that play, you get the kid whose dad has the best bathrobe. That is, that is Joseph's ornate robe. Um, but we can probably understand it as like a really high-class garment, like someone in powers, may, maybe not royalty, but maybe someone who just has a lot of money would wear. Now, this is your, this is your Sunday best clothing. And the problem is that Joseph wore this coat a lot. Like, imagine having a tuxedo that you bought for some event, and then you also use it to mow your grass, right? And this is what Joseph's doing with this thing, because he liked to be seen in it. He liked to, so I don't know if Joseph was, um, 
like just super arrogant and proud or maybe he was just like super naive he had no self-awareness and he didn't realize that what he was doing was really making his brothers angry but the second thing he did was he wore that coat a lot and then his third mistake is this Joseph starts telling his brothers about these dreams he's been having and Joseph is known as the dreamer in fact in that musical it's the technicolor dream coat okay the whole idea of Joseph's life and, and this ability to have these amazing dreams and interpret dreams become one of his greatest gifts and so we'll find that later in his story but he starts having these dreams and he starts telling his brothers about them. I encourage you to read it on your own. It's in verses like five through nine and all around there in chapter 37. But basically in these dreams, there's different versions where he imagines himself as something that's being bowed down to by all of his brothers and his parents. And there everyone's bowed down to him. So guess who he goes and tells? His brothers who hate him. His brothers who believe that their dad loves him more than they love, he loves them, right? And he's like, guys, guess what? I had another dream. Yeah, listen, I was like the sun, and you guys were like stars. Man, you loved me, man. You were bowing down. And uh, you want to, let's play a game called Joseph's Dreams. Okay, I'll be the sun. Okay, right? And like, they're like, so they start to conspire, and they're like, have you ever been so angry at your siblings that you're like, I want to kill them? I mean, you may have said that out loud. These guys are not joking. They're like, we want to end his life. There are plenty of us brothers to go around. So there's 12 of us, so who, the world's not going to miss one more. So they begin to conspire. I said that the family was a powder keg, and with those dreams, Joseph lights the match. And it's about to, boom, blow up. And that is where we take a time out on Joseph's story today. Because we could keep going, but we'd be here all day, because he's got 14 chapters. What do we do with that? I don't know that every piece of the Bible is supposed to be like, this is advice to how to live your life. I don't think that, actually, I don't think that most of the Bible is that. I think we read the Bible like chicken soup for the soul. Remember those books on the coffee table? And it's like, let me just be encouraged. I think some of them are like, these are real life stories. Read them and just see what happened. But I think that some of it really teaches us some ways that we can grow, that we can change. And most importantly, our goal for this series is to say, what does it look like for me to be a God chaser? Um... Maybe you've grown up in dysfunction. I think on some candid moments, all of us at some point are like, yeah, I grew up in a dysfunctional family. We probably need to be a little more fair and say that, no, a lot of us grew up in fairly healthy families. Did your parents fight? Yeah, everyone's parents fight. You know, did you, did you, did you not have a ton of money? Yeah, most people didn't have a ton of money. And so like, but not to discredit that because all of that shapes who we are. Maybe you truly grew up in a really dysfunctional family. One or both of your parents was not around. Maybe you, maybe you bounced around in foster care for a while. Maybe some really traumatic thing happened that just altered the way your family functioned. All of that leaves a mark on us. So whether it's minor or major, I don't want to say that it doesn't matter. And maybe you had a great family life, but your other relationships were dysfunctional. You dated a girl or a guy who just, man, just that shouldn't have happened. Uh, you at a point had a child that wasn't like part of the master plan and then you had to work through that. Maybe you've lost a loved one. I could go on and on. You get it, right? And through those things, there's this, whether it's dysfunction, because dysfunction is kind of like we kind of displace on other people or maybe it's just pain. Where do we go in all of that to still seek God? How can I be a God chaser in the chaos? Um, well, I want to call out a few realities because Joseph's life was that. I mean, he had imperfect parents. He had jealous brothers. And then Joseph brings his own mess to the party and contributes a fair amount there that made it. I mean, but let, let's look at a few realities. The first reality that I think we can look at is this. And I think it's important to say things like that. The first one is this. It is difficult to be faithful to God when you're surrounded by dysfunctional relationships. Okay? If you have found that that's hard, I want you to know something. I mean, you know this. You're intelligent, but maybe it helps to hear someone say it out loud. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And so we don't just be like, get over it. Like, stop. I mean, some people have it harder than others. I heard this great analogy about approaching God. And, and we, we talk about, uh, like, hitting targets with God. Like, I'm shooting a bow and arrow. And we're all trying to hit this target with God. But someone one time said uh, to me that maybe, maybe this thing about approaching God is less like bow and arrow and a target. And it's more like a javelin thrower and a line. And so imagine we're all throwing javelin for track and field meet, and some of us get to start really close to the line and throw, and we get, I don't know, 50 yards, and some of us have to start way back here and throw, and maybe you're throwing it way harder, and you're doing even better, and you're only getting it just past the line. We're starting in different places. 
And so I just want to just like put it out there. It's difficult. So if you feel the pressure of that, I want you to know that that's normal and it's okay. You don't have to stay there. Uh, One thing that I want to say, especially to us as parents or people who are kind of leading family groups or households, we need to do our best to try to help our kids not grow up in dysfunction. One thing that breaks my heart, I'm literally preaching to the choir here, almost literally. You're not actually a choir. You don't have robes, but you're at church. But maybe you need to hear this. You know, every time we keep our kids away from Christian community, maybe you worked hard, maybe you had overtime, Maybe you've got a busy schedule. I don't know. You've got sports. You've got PTA. You've got things. Every time we don't take our kids to a thing with Christian community, you're missing it. But guess who else is missing it? Your kids are. And maybe you had 38 years of great Christian family, and now we're busy. But your kids are still seven. And they really need this foundational community thing. That's huge. And it's our job, parents, to do our best not to have dysfunctional family. And if we've got issues, you know what we need to do? We need to figure it out. We need to go get counseling. We need to talk to uh, godly people that can help us along. We need to build community. We need to admit our faults, right? I mean, I'm talking to myself as much as anybody, but it's hard. That's the first reality. It's hard. The second reality is this, and this is powerful. It is possible to be faithful despite dysfunctional relationships. It's possible. So don't feel distraught. Don't feel lost. Don't feel forgotten. Uh, It's difficult, but it's possible. And so as we close today, I, I want to just kind of Look, look at some questions that we can ask ourselves. Like, what does it mean for us to grow out of the dysfunction? Um, maybe you don't feel super dysfunctional. Maybe you feel like, I'm too dysfunctional for this to even work. I think that we're all kind of coming from a, a similar playing ground, though, because we live in a broken world, and we all carry hurt with us. And so there's two questions I think that we can ask as we kind of get our minds thinking to move on from here today. The first one is this. What hurt has someone else caused in you that you need to heal from? Um... Man, just the ability to, to say out loud how I'm broken and how I'm hurting, that's, that's cleansing. Maybe you need to journal it. Maybe you need to talk to your spouse about it. Maybe you need to talk to someone else about it. The, the, one of the worst things we can do with our past when it's hurt is to sweep it under the rug and pretend like it didn't happen. If you've ever taken a bottle, uh, like a soda bottle, put the lid on tight and shake it, 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 shake it. You ever been that next person that gets to open it? That's what happens to that poor person that cuts you off in traffic. That's what happens to that kid, your, your, your child, who like, you know, okay, they didn't put their socks in the hamper, but it's probably not like that big a deal. Like maybe, you know, we, we have stuff that we pack down and we don't deal with, and then we explode in other places, or it implodes. It hurts us. And so it's important for us to begin to unpack these things. What are they? So just identifying it's a big, big start. Um, and, and to ask this question, what would it look like for me to take that heart, that, sorry, what would it look like for me to take that hurt to God? I mean, what does it look like to take something to God? Well, we, we pray about it. We talk to godly friends about it. We daily make the commitment that we're going to seek healing and the promises of God instead of seeking revenge and, and remorse and guilt and uh, grief, like whatever those hurts are. Like, we've got to say, I've got to reset my focus. These aren't the things I'm going to pursue anymore. I'm going to pursue the promises of God and the goodness of God. Um, and so this is just a start. I'm telling you from my experience in my own life and in the many people that I love that I've tried to help through things, that it, it's, it's helpful. And I love this passage from Jesus. This is from Matthew chapter 11. He says it straight up. He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight. he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. His yoke means his... Uh, kind of his, his set of teachings and his values and his life, like this was like a, a, a phrase that a, um, a rabbi would use. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And that idea that I'm just so heavy laden with the stuff of my life, if I could just daily begin to try to turn it over piece by piece to God. And it's gonna be small steps, it's incremental, but it's putting in the reps day by day And so asking that first question, how have I been hurt? And then saying, what would it look like for me to turn that over to God? That's the first thought as we think about this brokenness, this dysfunction. The second question is this, and this is extremely important. We talked about self-awareness. The second question is, what hurt have I caused someone else that I need to learn from? Or maybe that I've caused to a situation. Maybe it didn't hurt someone, but like Joseph, like he just was not aware and he said things that were stupid and... Maybe he wasn't even necessarily wrong for wearing that coat around. I mean, it was a nice coat, you know? 
Like, you would want to wear your nice coat too, but maybe he could learn from that. And I think a lot of owning our own mess is just being aware of areas that we can grow. Now, we could talk, we could do a whole other like, lesson on, like, if you've hurt someone else, what does it mean to ask for forgiveness? What does it mean to go make things right? And, and all those things. Like, that's, that's a whole different piece of the puzzle. But right now, we're talking about your healing. And part of your healing is not to make the same mistake over and over again. Have you ever sit, hit yourself in the finger with a hammer? That's like one of the dumbest mistakes in history. And I've done it so many times. You're just like, bam, wham, wham. And I'm sitting here like, man, I should let go of this nail sooner. <laughs> wham. And then you got the blood blister thumbnail and it's like ah and all the words that you shouldn't say either come out your mouth or they come through your brain which is the same thing and you're just like oh oh and there's nothing you can do but suck your thumb it's all that you can do there is nothing you can do and we do that to ourselves all the time we repeat the same mistakes over and over and they are self-inflicted wounds so that's the question what is some pain that you've caused that you need to learn from um i still hit myself in the finger with hammers (laughs) And I still make some of the same stupid mistakes I've been making since I was 12 years old. But day by day, I'm like, okay, let me grow. And guess what? We can do those, the same thing that we did with our hurt, we can do with our mistakes. We turn those over to God. And we say, God, help me grow in this. And we surround ourselves with good, godly accountability. And we say, how can I grow in this? Call me out. Help me. I want to be better. I want to be a God chaser. What if you simply started seeking godly self-control in your life? Do you know that when God's Holy Spirit comes to dwell with us, like we're, we're promised in Scripture that when we accept Jesus, uh, we're told, for, for example, in one place in Acts chapter 2, that when we are baptized into Christ, we receive the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit in our life is a guide, it's a teacher, it's a comforter. And do you know one of the gifts that the Holy Spirit brings and the fruit that comes out of his presence in our life is the ability to control ourselves? And we've got to lean into him. We've got to ask for that. And that self-control piece is when we learn to grow past the hurt that we cause. So that's a big piece. I think that if Joseph had not worn that coat so much and had not bragged about his dreams to his brothers, he would never end up in the situations that he's going to be in later. Now, God's going to work through all that too. But the question is, when do we want to start handing it over to God? I recommend earlier rather than later. And I guarantee you, if we lined up by age order right now, don't worry, we're not going to do that. But if we did, the people at the older end of the line would look down to the people at the younger end of the line and be like, for real, will you please learn from me? <laughs> please, learn. you don't have to do the things I did. And so, and so I think that's a major part that God's Holy Spirit in our life can bring. No matter what led to the dysfunction in your life, the brokenness, the hurt, this is what I want us to know. God can forgive us. God can use us. And so if you're in a place this morning where you just need to, to turn that over to God, let's make today the day. Let's do that. We have a time every single week where you have an opportunity to talk to somebody, one of our elders, one of our leaders at our church. You can just go talk to them. You can talk through the stuff you're going through. We have an opportunity literally every single day where you could accept Jesus as your Savior. Like, I accept the gift you gave me. It doesn't have to happen on a Sunday morning during a church service. You could be at work and be like, I just, I'm ready to give it all to Jesus. Call one of your church friends. Say, look, I made this decision. Um, Tell your friend who's an atheist next to you. And they'll be like, you did what? You're like, yeah, let me tell you about it. It'd be awesome. We could meet somewhere. We could have a baptism. We could have a party in heaven. It's going to be great. Make that decision because as we do that, we begin to aim our life towards God. Chase him with our passions, with our desires, and learn to become better. The thing about being a God chaser is not that we hit it out of the park every day. It's that every day we get our eyes set in the right place. And so Joseph's life is just a piece of that story. And our life is the continuation of that. Joseph's life is a roller coaster. But even through the roller coaster, God is constant. And he can bring us closer to him every single day if we just let him. Let me pray for us this morning.